start the recording. So um, thank you again for joining the participation report webinar. Um, my name is Anna Tolwinska and I'm a member experience manager here at Crossroads. I work as part of the member and community outreach team. And it's my pleasure to talk to you a bit about participation reports. Um, today, I will show you how easily you can um, track what metadata you're registering with Crossref, uh, why you should be checking the report regularly, how to interpret the report, and also how to improve your metadata coverage levels. This will be a first of regularly scheduled webinars. I'm hoping to run them monthly. My colleagues Kirsty Meddings from our product team and Shane Smolian from our support team are also on this webinar and will help me with any questions while I'm presenting. Uh, please submit the questions through the chat window or the Q&A if you have that availability. Um, Christy was actually instrumental in bringing participation reports to life, and we're always brainstorming on how to improve, um, improve uh, them. And Shane uh, Smolian from our support team is fantastic at fielding various queries from our community. So thank you both for joining. Um, Okay, so before we jump in, I'm going to share a quick poll. Um, hopefully everyone um, will see um, the poll. It should say, all the metadata I collect is automatically sent to Crossref. Um, if everyone could um, select one um, answer, that would be great. I'm gonna share the results in a little bit. I'll give it a few, a minute or so to get everyone. And please keep this question in mind throughout this webinar. I'll uh, return to this question a little bit later on um, in the webinar. So let's, uh, let's keep this question in mind. And it seems like everyone has voted. So I'm going to end the poll. Um, and just for uh, curiosity, curiosity's sake, I'm going to share the results. So um, seems like not sure, not not sure has won. Um, all right, so let's uh, keep this question in mind for later, and uh, we're going to move on. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started now by telling you a bit more about the reports. Um, so what are the reports? Um, they are a place where you can track what metadata you're registering with Crossref. They are open and free to use by anyone. Um, they allow our members to track what metadata they're registering with us, which is not always easy. And they allow for the opportunity to evaluate and educate and for members to see how they measure up and also see where the gaps are so that they can be improved. They are now about a year and a half old. Uh, we launched them in the summer of 2018. Um, they are in beta or what we like to call phase one. Um, so we're hoping to improve them. So your feedback is very valuable. Uh, and you may be wondering why we developed these reports. Um, well, they came about mainly because we have been hearing from our members at conferences and emails and um, in meetings um, that they're not always sure what metadata they're registering with us. So we always assumed that our members knew exactly what they were sending us. Um, and we'd ask questions such as, are you registering abstracts? And we'd get a, um, a long pause or a slightly puzzled look and then um, an answer like, well, now that you ask, I'm not really sure if we're sending them. I thought we were. Um, so we decided to make it easier for our members and ourselves as well to see what metadata was being registered. This data has always been available um, or for some quite some time via our REST API, but not everyone knew how to query our API as it was not very user friendly. It was more geared at machines than humans and also um, not uh, didn't have an easy to use interface. Another reason for the participation reports was that it made it easier for our members to see what's missing and to fill in the gaps and to update their, update their metadata. So how can we expect someone to fix something if they're not sure that something is actually missing? 
Um, and lastly, uh, the reports allow our members to track their progress and see if they have um, updated it actually, um, or what they have updated is actually being reflected in Crossref. So a good example of this is if a member uses a third party, like a vendor or a service provider for their Crossref deposits, sometimes there's a bit of um, miscommunication uh, or a bit for example, a publisher may use several vendors or service providers. They may send all of their metadata to vendor number one, and that that vendor sends some of the metadata, but not all, to another service provider that registers the content with Crossref. In many instances, not all of the metadata makes it to Crossref because um, of different requirements, for example, or different formats. Um, so conversations with your vendors are really important. Um, this brings us back to our at the beginning of the webinar, you may think that you're sending across ref a lot of metadata, but in reality, only a portion of it may actually be ending up in cross ref. Um, so it's important to register as much metadata as you can, because that metadata, that metadata makes your content more useful and more discoverable. Um, so now we'll take a look at how that happens. So um, where does the metadata in Crossref end up? Um, because Cross, Crossref's metadata is standardized and machine readable, it is very useful to many different organizations that make your content more discoverable. And here are a few examples. Um, so library discovery services, um, services uh, for collaborative authoring, annotation services, um, various scholarly sharing networks, all of these different types of organizations and services uh, run on um, uh, or use Crossref's metadata. So it's, it's really important to uh, register as much rich metadata as you possibly can um, because it does help uh, make your content uh, more useful, richer, and um, uh, presented to your readers uh, in an easier way. So when you're registering your metadata, it's also very important to keep in mind that the metadata is correct. So there are no errors, typos, et cetera, complete. Um, so all of the fields that you can manage, not just the first author, but all of them, uh, publication dates, anything that's not required as well. So ask your authors for ORCIDs and um, uh, try to include funding data as well. Um, and thirdly, make sure that your metadata is up to date um, uh, and talk to your vendors as well, um, as they not, they're not always aware of what you'd like them to register or there may be um, additional costs involved or the vendors may not have the capability at this time, um, as well as um, think about your own um, budgets and staff and time constraints as well. Uh, but once you update your metadata, you can expect it or deposit it, you can expect it to, uh, to see it reflected in the participation report in about 24 hours. Okay, so now um, let's actually see how participation reports work. Um, so you can navigate to the main page of the reports um, and I will share, um, if I can find the chat window, um, I'm going to share the link to the report so you can do that as well. Okay. Please bear with me for a second. So this is the URL for the participation reports. Um, and when you end up on this page, uh, you will see a search box um, that you will see a search box that says where you can type in the um, your organization's name. So today I'm going to look at Rockefeller University Press. And when you end up on um, on this page, um, you see the name of the organization. So if you selected the incorrect name, you can go back to find a member and click back and make sure um, that you actually selected the right one. Um, or that's where you can look up another um, report as well. 
so when you're back here, um, you uh, can um, take a look at the total registered content items. That is a number of total um, registered DOIs in Crossref, and it's dependent on this dropdown, which is tells you what what the date range is. So if you want to look at all of the DOIs that a member registered or that you registered since you've joined Crossref, you have to change the drop down to all time. So um, Rockefeller University Press, which I'm using as an example because they have um, very good uh, coverage for current content, uh, they've registered 60,000 total registered DOIs. So the top um, level here uh, displays the name of the organization and also total registered content items dependent on the date range. Um, before we move on, I also wanted to point out that there's a learn more uh, section here. Um, if you click on it, it will take you to a page that explains, um, you know, member participation and the participation report in more detail. So if you're ever wondering what you're looking at, um, or if you have a question about one of the items on this report, you can always go back to learn more. Okay, so let's move on to the next section. Um, the next section is the content type. Um, this displays the content type that you've selected and you can change the content type in the drop down menu. Um, however, this particular publisher only has journal articles. Um, so there is only one content type that we're looking at here. If we wanted to look at additional content types, we need to select a member that um, has different content types. So um, let's look at Springer Science. Um, uh, they have four different content types that are registered and you can uh, navigate between the different content types here. So if a member does uh, register more than one, um, they can, you can select the different content type. Uh, but let's um, focus today on Rockefeller University Press. Um, we are looking at the journal article content type here. Um, and on the other side um, that I mentioned before, we have the current content type, um, uh, which is the date range. This year, current content is described as um, anything that was published in the year that we're in and two prior years. So for this year, it's 2020, 2019, and 2018. That's um, the definition of current content. Uh, if we select back file, that's everything before current content. So anything that has been uh, registered prior to 2018, so 2017 and back. Um, and as I change the uh, date ranges, you may have noticed that the total number of DOIs or um, total number of registered content items changes as well. Um, so um, if I go back, it's only 1,400 uh, registered in the last you know, two years or so, um, but backfile, of course, has uh, way more at 50, over 58,000. Um, but we will be looking at current content today. Um, the search box in the middle indicates that you can look up a specific journal title if that um, publisher registers um, or if you yourself as an organization register more than one journal. So in this case, um, they do, and you can select one from the drop down and look specifically just at um, a journal at a time. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to be looking at all of the journals that uh, have been registered um, in the last two years. Um, so the first, um, uh, the second section that we're going to be looking at is the um, key elements section. So the, the key elements add context and richness and help open up your content to easier discovery um, for a wider and more varied use. So we think that they're very important. So uh, all of these um, key elements are not required. They're, um, uh, you can register them um, in addition to the basic bibliographic information that's required, but we do encourage you to do so. Um, so for references, you may have noticed that there are little eyes, um, uh, a little icon with an eye next to it. If you hover over that icon, it will tell you what you're uh, currently looking at. So for example, you may be looking at, um, uh, 
it, the definition of what references the key element means. So percentage of content items that include reference lists in their metadata, that is the percentage that you're looking at. So 96% of all of the currently uh, registered DOIs for the journal articles, so 1400, 96% of the 1400 articles have references registered in the metadata. Um, and that goes for every each one of these key elements. Um, so uh, for open references, for example, it, it is a percentage of registered references that are set to be openly available. So you have a choice in Crossref to make your references open and available to all users across all of Crossref APIs and services. Um, and you can um, make that distinction. And if they are not open, it would say 0%. And if they are open, um, it would say 100%. So it's sort of like an all or nothing, unless you have um, multiple prefixes, and then you can set that preference on uh, prefix by prefix basis. So if you do see a number on your report that is not zero and is not 100%, it's somewhere in between, and you'd like it to be all, please let us know and we can change that. Um, next up on our list are ORCID identifiers. Um, so once again, 95% uh, of the, um, all of the articles um, that are current content have at least one ORCID registered in the metadata. And it's really important because it does help precisely identify a researcher's work. So I would encourage your um, authors to um, uh, get ORCIDs and also uh, submit them to you. Uh, when they um, submit their manuscripts. Um, next up, we have funder registry identifiers. Once again, um, it just um, it's, contains the name and funder registry ID. So at least one of the organizations that funded the research has been included. And in this case, it's 82% of the four, over 1400 journal articles have at least one funder um, name included in the metadata. And the same um, thing goes for uh, funding award numbers or grant numbers. Um, they are also 77% um, of all of the articles of, that have been registered in the last two years have that. And just if we stay on um, the little info box, I just wanted to point out that you can click on what is, why is this important? Where can I learn more and how can I improve this score? All these three links will take you back to that learn more page that I pointed out before and it does it's really helpful and it does explain this a little bit better. Um, okay, uh, next up we have cross mark enabled. Um, this means that 99% of all of the uh, current content articles um, have um, are displaying a cross mark and cross mark is a service that we offer that uh, lets um, your readers know whether the content has changed since publication. So whether it's been uh, updated, corrected, or even retracted. Um, and just recently, uh, we announced that we no longer have a fee for Crossmarks. So um, if you were, um, you know, if that was what was preventing you from joining Crossmark, um, there is no fee associated with it now. So you can uh, register Crossmark metadata uh, free of charge. Uh, next up, we have text mining URLs. Um, text mining URLs just represent the percentage of registered content containing full text URLs in the metadata to help researchers locate your content for text and data mining. So if you're getting a lot of requests for text and data mining from uh, libraries or from researchers, um, you can make it easier on yourselves and also for um, uh, the researcher and include the full text um, of your articles that can be used for the purposes of text and data mining. Um, additionally, you can even include the text and data mining license in the metadata. Um, so we allow for different types of licenses to be included in Crossref. Uh, text and data mining is one of them, but open access licenses, co any copyright license that you'd like to include, you can do so as well. Um, and um, in this case, 99% of all of the journal articles registered by Rockefeller University Press um, have um, licenses included. Um, if we're staying on the um, URL front, 
Similarity check URLs are another type of URL that you can include or full text URL that you can include, um, especially if you're um, uh, participating in similarity check service. That is a requirement to register uh, similarity, full text similarity um, uh, check URLs for the purposes of um, authenticate to index your full text content to be included in the similarity check database that others can check against. Um, so uh, that is something that you can also uh, include. And um, uh, if you'd like to see um, the growth, you can kind of track the participation report and see where you're at and if you're eligible, because you do have to reach a certain amount um, of um, uh, coverage to join similarity check. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have abstracts. So uh, about 96% of the total 1400 articles that are um, currently registered or current content um, have abstracts registered um, by Rockefeller University Press. Um, so um, it's really useful. It gives uh, for further insight into the content of your work if you do include them. So that is something that you can include as well. Okay, um, I think that is about it. I just wanted to um, show you back files as well. So the coverage is not, you know, always as great for the back files as it is for current content. So if you do look at your own report, um, you might, you know, don't be surprised that the percentages are a bit lower. Uh, we would encourage you to, you know, um, update your back files if you can, but we understand that it's um, a big job for most, uh, most of our members. So uh, we do um, encourage you to register as much as you possibly can for your current content and what you can for the back files. Okay, let's go back to our presentation for a moment. Um, now I have an activity for everyone. I'm going to stop um, the recording now um, and we'll um, continue uh, the webinar um, with an activity.